Hi, everybody. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. I want to start with our land acknowledgement. We'd like to acknowledge the Ramaytu Shaloni people, who are the traditional custodians of this land. We pay our respects to the Ramaytu Shaloni elders, past, present, and future, who call this place, the land that UCSF sits upon, their home. We're proud to continue their tradition of coming together and growing as a community. We thank the Ramaytu Shaloni community for their stewardship and support, and we look forward to strengthening our ties as we continue our relationship of mutual respect and understanding. And I'd like to invite our Vice Chair for Education, Dr. Sandrine Van Shaik, to introduce our speakers for today. Hi, everybody, and welcome. The, the audience here is still a little sparse, but we know that that means that people are um, still coming down from rounds and other places. So um, hopefully we'll get joined by more people soon. Um, uh, I have an enormously long bio to, to uh, read here, um, so um, I'm going to read it uh, uh, briefly. Um, it's a panel of speakers that we have today, and I'm pretty sure they probably actually will say more about who they are and uh, what brought them here uh, today. Um, but uh, the three people that are here, um, there's three people here in the room and then one person on Zoom, is that correct? So we today have Dr. Uh, Aris Oates, Dr. Julie O'Brien, Dr. Nicole Ling, and Dr. Mariama with Tamarat. Um, they, um, and the four of them are um, inform informaticists, which is a word that I struggle with because of the multiple syllabus, but also because it's something that didn't exist when I was a resident or even early in my career. Um, and I've increasingly learned what informaticists do. And I think we should be incredibly grateful that we have them and that we have such talented people in our department um, because they really are trying to make everything that makes our work harder, easier. Is that a fair summary of what the work that you do? Yeah, um, that's what I thought. So um, um, they, uh, the, the uh, four of them um, are in particularly um, interested in uh, raising visibility and addressing uh, disparities in the use of e-portals at UCSF. They work at the intersection of technology and quality patient care and ensure the tools that improve patient outcomes are available to all in an equitable way. Um, and this is actually how we came to this presentation. I can't remember exactly how and when it came up, but uh, in a prior grant round, someone said, you know, there's a lot of work that's actually being done to try to um, optimize the access to um, our uh, portals for people um, uh, beyond the people who are well educated, English speaking, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, when we started to say, okay, who's doing that? Um, we actually came across, I think the first name that I came across was Dr. Aris Oates, who I've known forever, one of our nephrologists uh, uh, here. And, uh, and then he said, well, we have a team. So this will be a team presentation. And I'm really excited to hear what, um, you, what your work is all about. So welcome. Hello, I'm Mariamo Tamarat, and I'm a pediatrician at the FQHC in Oakland. And today we'll be talking to you about my chart um, and how we looked at it through a healthcare equity lens. Our objectives today are to discuss with you and help you understand um, national and local e-portal disparities, um, understand interventions that we've work towards to reduce e-portal disparities. And then we'll have a discussion about ways that we hope to contribute to ongoing improvement and ways that you also can contribute to that um, improvement. So what is my chart? My chart is UCSF's patient portal and it's a virtual care platform. That's, um, I'm sorry, it's, a, it's UCSF's patient portal and it's a secure platform that is accessed by a web browser or mobile application. And it's directly, this secure platform is directly connected to the EHR system. Um, patient portals are a key part of many virtual care workflows. And this was really propelled over the last few years during the COVID pandemic, where a lot of ambulatory um, care switched over to a virtual platform. And so having access to those virtual, um, the patient portal was really important for patients to access care. It's also an access point for electronically shared medical records. And patient portal use has been associated with better outcomes in screening rates, 
medication adherence, and patient satisfaction. So next we'll talk a little bit about EHR milestones. So how did we get to where we are today? Um, this began in, the 19, in 1968 with um, the idea of problem-oriented medical records. So Dr. Lawrence Weed was a physician at the University of Vermont, and he was really troubled by the way that documentation was done by physicians. And he described it as just a stream of consciousness and medical records were just a stream of consciousness from that provider. And so he created the problem oriented medical record. And this is one of the first and most successful attempts to streamline and improve the keeping of medical records. In 1972, this led way to the first iteration of what we now know as the EHR at the Reigenstrife Institute in Indianapolis. Um, led by Dr. Clement McDonald, um, the first EHR was in use. Also at the same time, the VA was the first major organization to implement use of an EHR. In 1991, a lot of us remember the explosion of the World Wide Web, and this had a big impact on the capabilities of the EHR. And along with the improvements in technological capabilities, this helped drive the adoption of EHRs across the country. In 1996, um, the HIPAA Act, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act was introduced to protect patients and their medical data. So this was the first time that there were standards for vendors to comply to privacy standards for patients and to make the to improve the use of the EHR. In 1998, um, the first patient portals were introduced and adopted by a few large healthcare organizations. So locally, the Palo Alto Medical Foundation incorporated use of MyChart, and there was a, um, another platform that was used in Boston Children's at the time, but still very few organizations. In the early 2000s, the EHR, we, we saw more EHR standardization and adaptation across the country. There was a new generation of electronic health records that were built. Um, around physical, technical, and administrative safeguards. And this, this new generation of EHRs was also moving towards more of an integrated um, and centralized system. In 2009, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, as a part of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, Congress passed the High Tech Act. And the High Tech Act was the Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health. And this act focused on the implementation of, and the use of healthcare information technology, and it put a particular emphasis on privacy and security. This act um, had a large incentive of $36 billion that was allotted to it. Um, and then this, the idea was that this would create a rush to adopt qualifying EHR systems. In 2010, um, the Department of Health and Human Services defined what constitutes meaningful use. Um, a lot of us are familiar with this term now, um, but this was the first time that incentive payments were added to Medicaid and Medicare reimbursements for meeting certain quality metrics. Um, and so the EHR was able to support those, the driving of those quality metrics. In 2012, UCSF went live with a clinical enterprise-wide EHR system that unified both ambulatory and inpatient services. Um, and this included the patient portal um, use for the first time with my chart. Uh, in 2013, across the Bay, Children's Hospital Oakland also went live with its EHR. Um, it was also both ambulatory and inpatient. And then in 2015, um, President Obama signed into the law the MACRA Act, which was the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act. And the intent here was to um, improve the relationship between organizations and providers. And um, there was a transition from away from kind of a pure fee-for-service um, platform to more of a value-based care. So reimbursements were now tied to value-based care and this held providers more accountable for high quality and cost-efficient care. Um, in 2017, the merit-based incentive payment system came into effect um, and this was designed to, to tie payments to quality and cost-efficient care and hopefully drive improvements in healthcare outcomes. In 2019, um, 
ZSFG went live with its version of APEX. And then in 2020, uh, BCH Oakland joined UCSF's version of instance of, of um, APEX. And now we have a combined cross bay um, system in Oakland and San Francisco. And then in 2021, this is very familiar to many of us, the 21st Century Cures Act was implemented. And um, although the purpose was to um, regulate more inclusive information sharing, probably the most apparent thing to many of us providers was the requirement that all U.S. healthcare systems share notes with patients um, via the electronic platform. So... Over 50 years of healthcare technology ad and advancement. Um, and during that time, although information technology has become a lot more accessible, there are groups that have um, continued to have disparities. And this quote from uh, Dr. Julian Torter Hart, um, from the, which is, uh, which refers to the inverse care law was published in the Lancet in 1971. And he said that the availability of good medical care tends to vary inversely with the need for it and the population served. And so the patients that have the highest need for health management have the least access to new technology that could improve said management. Inequitable access to health information technology like patient portals has the potential to worsen outcome disparities. And so although this was said over 50 years ago, it still holds true in many parts of the US. The patients who have the highest need for healthcare management are the ones who receive care in under-resourced clinics or have less staffing to support um, the many aspects to help improve healthcare disparities. So then that brings us to the question of equality versus equity. And so this is an updated version of a slide that many have seen um, before, but here we're talking about equity versus equality versus equity. So when you think about who has access to patient portals, everyone has access. It's equal access. Anyone can go online, sign up and activate an account for themselves or their children. When you think about equity, are the people who have the most challenges to accessing said platform, do they have what they need in order to <coughs> access this? Have we understood the barriers, the circumstances, and the conditions that might make it challenging for them to access equitable care? Despite the advances that we talked about in healthcare technology over the last 50 years, racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic disparities in healthcare outcomes persist. We know that Black, Latin A, and Native American patients, as well as patients of lower socioeconomic status, and those patients who have a limited English proficiency, experience structural inequity, and those worse health and have worse health outcomes when compared to white, wealthy, English-speaking patients, despite an interest that these patients may have in improving their health care. So. What are the things that you have access to when you're, my, when you're active on my chart? At UCSF, you have appointment visibility and scheduling. That means that you can schedule an appointment, you can cancel an appointment, you can reschedule an appointment without having to pick up the phone and speak to anybody. Not only do you have easy access to schedule set appointments, but there's a feature where there's an electronic waiting list that you only have access to via the MyChart portal. And if there's a cancellation, a sudden last minute cancellation, you get a notification and a text message in the app that invites you to take that sooner appointment. So not only do you not do not only do you have struggle with scheduling appointments, but this access, you no longer have access to that quick sooner appointment that you may need that might have been really important to your healthcare. Um, we talked earlier about open notes. Patients can see their notes um, on my chart and they can see results. It's important for them to be able to review it. But if you're somebody who has more challenges with managing your medical care, you may want to take those notes back to your family member or somebody else who's helping you in the community. And they would help you understand what are the things that you need to do in order to meet, in order to improve your health um, and having access to that helps to bridge that gap. There's also improved communication with care teams. Um, you can message your doctor, you can message your healthcare team and get a response for things that are not necessarily urgent, but don't require you to come into the building or you don't have to um, sit on the phone and wait on hold. 
There are other features like access to um, virtual visits and being able to use Zoom visits for your telehealth visits, et cetera. So there's a lot of features um, that people who are active have access to. So knowing all of this, we got together and looked at where is UCSF Health and its MyChart activation rates. As of June 2021, this was our starting point. When to the left, you can see that um, we compared pediatric rates to adult activation rates and pediatric adult activation rates were 89% in June, 2021 compared to 49% for pediatrics. And to the graph to the right, you can see that um, we compared pediatric primary care compared to pediatric specialty. So in the East Bay, um, the percentage rate for pediatric primary care was 30% compared to the West Bay, which was 90%. And then in terms of specialty care, again, comparing the East Bay to the West Bay, less than 30% in the East Bay and a little over 60% activation rates in the West Bay. So those disparities were really clear to us um, when we started this work. We also have for you, we also looked at this by race and ethnicity. And so we're looking at a graph pediatric my chart activation by race and ethnicity. And on the X axis, you have um, we have the dates. So to the far right, you can see that we're, um, we've included June, 2021, but we have data points going back a year. And the green and white and yellow lines um, represent the white or Caucasian populations and those patients who um, are of Asian um, race. And the yellow and the gray lines represent the Latin A populations and the black or African-American. And so you can see that the disparity there when we started this work in June 2021 was in the high 60s compared to the low 30s. Um, and the other thing that's important to note in this graph is that these lines are pretty linear uh, or pretty horizontal, I should say. There wasn't much improvement in activation rates overall during this year long period of data. We've also included um, information or our data by language preference. Um, and so in the blue, you can see that patients who speak English or preferred English, preferred language of English, um, have a percentage of 54% activation rate in June, and then um, compared to our Spanish and other language preferences. So Spanish is a little bit hard to see there, but it was 12% in June, 2021. Um, and patients who had a preferred language other than English or Spanish, um, their percentage was at 14% in June, 2021. So again, a really striking difference in terms of um, who has who had access at that time um, to my chart. And so just this graphic that we saw before, um, to the right, you can see adults, adult patients, patients in the West Bay, white and Asian patients, and patients who have a preferred language of English um, were more likely to be active and were actually had higher rates of activation on my chart compared to the groups um, to the left, pediatric, East Bay, Latin A, Black African American and limited English proficiency. So Eris will now go over um, some of the interventions that we did to try and improve these disparities. Thanks so much, Mari. We had a lot of work cut out for us when we got started. Um, and so we looked at other institutions to see what wheel had been created so we didn't have to recreate it. And how do we take those interventions and apply them here at UCSF and extend them to improve and make sure that we uh, are improving our equity. Um, there's, when you're approaching such equity gaps, approaching it from a holistic approach was necessary. So I'm gonna spend some time talking about some key technical interventions. Dr. Ling next will talk uh, about some others, uh, but I'm really gonna focus on three areas of re removing workflow inequities, improving language access equities, and understanding data and landscape. Um, for how we approached this problem. Um, as Dr. Tamara pointed out, there are gaps nationwide in patients who are active on my chart or active on an e-portal versus those that are not. Um, and it's important to think about what are the driving biases that could affect that. Um, there's been a lot of literature looking at what are some of the causes. Um, the US Health Information National Trends Survey from 2022 um, looked at patients who were offered an electronic portal by their healthcare provider and those that were encouraged. And were there any differences in that? And found that patients who are Black or Hispanic were less likely to even be offered at activation on an electronic portal 
or to be encouraged. And when they looked at total access rates that mirrored that experience, patients were Black and Hispanic patients were less likely to have accessed or to activate their portal. But if they looked at patients who had an equitable discussion or who were all offered access or who were all offered or encouraged by their healthcare provider to access or activate their electronic portal, the disparities didn't go away, but they definitely narrowed. Um, this data exists for uh, language as well. Patients whose preferred language of English uh, are more likely to be offered and encouraged to sign up than patients whose preferred language is something else. Um, so other institutions have tackled this in a number of ways. How do we remove this bias? Uh, they've put in standard information to patient instructions to have patients sign up. They've tried to incorporate into standard work so everyone is offering it the same. But they all have their limitations. That puts the burden on the patient to dig through their books of patient instructions and find an activation link. It still puts the burden, even with standard work, on people being people and doing the same thing. Um, looking beyond healthcare in 401ks, uh, there is improvement in 401k equity of employees contributing to their 401k if you auto-enroll everyone. There is improvement in mail-in ba ballots, so there is more equitable access to being able to vote by mail if you auto-enroll um, everyone so that you automatically get a mail-in ballot. And so we took a very similar approach here at UCSF, and we started just automatically sending people an activation to remove the bias. So uh, for patients 18 years and older, and I'll come back a little bit why we uh, put that in place for proxy and privacy reasons. Um, but if you came into our emergency department, if you scheduled an appointment, you came to your appointment or you got admitted to the hospital and you did not have MyChart active, you were sent this text message on your phone. Activate your MyChart account, click this link. Um, if your preferred language was Spanish, you would get this message in Spanish. And clicking the link allowed you to create a username and password, verify your identity with uh, your date of birth and zip code, and by clicking submit, you were active and on my chart with those simple steps. Um, and we saw a really good effect on our equity. So uh, just to orient you, this is an interrupted time series plotting the pr predictive probability of patients being active on my chart. This is six months before intervention. This line is when we started sending the offers, and these are the six months after. And you can see the, this line here and the slope of patients whose preferred language or something uh, that was not English is uh, significantly steeper than the line here, which is patients whose preferred language was English. Now, everyone experienced a bump. Everyone increased their activation. But patients whose preferred language was uh, not English experienced a higher bump. Uh, and a higher increase. The same thing can be seen uh, with patients whose race ethnicity was Asian, Black, African American, Latin A, and white, and, um, and other or compared to our white uh, patients. Putting this in a little bit uh, more numbers, you can see that the percent change or the increase in activation rates, while everyone again had increases, was seen more in our Black, Latin, Asian, and our preferred language other patients. So patients who historically had more barriers, by offering everyone this activation, we were able to overcome some of those barriers, particularly overcome in the patients we wanted to help and to improve. Now, I mentioned that we only did this for patients 18 years and up, um, and that's really because of proxies and privacy considerations, um, and really one of the fundamental difference between adult and pediatric. There's lots of differences, but the one that applied for us was that an adult has one record. A patient comes in, they're seen, and we can activate that. It's one step. But if you think about pediatrics and proxies and other people who are involved in care, there are many more steps. You first have to link that child's record to the parent record. You have to activate that parent on my chart. You have to verify that parent and guardian should actually have this access. Are they a legal guardian? Can they see the medical record? And you have to... Um, then make sure that they have a record. This is probably one of the reasons, as Dr. Tamarat was pointing out, that there are, uh, there's worse disparities in Oakland than in San Francisco. A lot of those uh, parent and guardians probably don't get their health care at UCSF and therefore don't already have a patient record. If you don't have this first step of a patient record for the parent and guardian, none of these other steps can be done. And that's where a lot of our focus right now is taking the learnings from removing our offer bias in 18 up plus and applying it here. So how do we automate these steps? And Dr. O'Brien will talk about that coming up.
shifting gears from removing offer bias to language access, um, there is no difference. If your preferred language is Spanish, if your race or ethnicity is Black or Hispanic Latino, they um, all desire to communicate with providers and their healthcare team electronically. Um, but in some ways, there may be an increased desire for this. Um, and some studies have looked at the value of clinical notes. Um, as Dr. Tamar pointed out, you can see in your my chart your clinical notes. And um, patients whose race was Black or Asian, ethnicity Hispanic, Latino, or preferred uh, language other than English actually ascribed a higher value to being able to see their notes. It helped them take care of their health having it helped them have an active role in care. It helped them feel in control of their care. It helped them make the most of their visits, remember their care plan and prepare for office visits. So when they don't have access to these services that actually, uh, that they value more, that actually increases our disparities even more than just the numbers. And very tangibly how we're, patients receiving inequitable care, they were just getting different services. My chart allows you to read notes, but also message with your healthcare team. And if your preferred language was English, you saw this, allow one to three business days for a response, urgent call 911, and then you could just message your healthcare team automatically. If your preferred language was Spanish, however, we added something additional. For now, we only accept messages in English. If you uh, prefer Spanish, please call our clinic and we'll give you a medical interpreter. This resulted in patients waiting on the phone, in phone trees, playing phone tag with their providers when other patients who spoke English could get their questions answered quickly. So we really appreciate the work that Dr. Susan Smith and Dave Morgan did from the faculty practice, but we now offer Spanish MyChart translation. Patients can send us messages in Spanish to our clinics. We send that message to a person, a Spanish medical translator, who turns that around and sends the message back to our patient. Step one, we only offer Spanish right now, but um, we're working to expand and hopefully improve our equity across the board. It's been used by over 80 clinics, um, the turnaround time from the time the patient sends us the message to when they get it back is about a day, a little bit more. So not actually that much delay for this translation. And it really allows equitable services. Um, still lots of work to do. And when we think about language access, it goes far beyond translating a MyChart message. You need to look at a holistic approach. I'm not going to go over all the interventions we did, but I do want to highlight a few. One is focus groups and really reaching out to patients and understanding what value they have and what barriers they have. Um, we've worked to incorporate systemic processes. So when you submit something to be put on the after visit summary, now instead of relying on you to remember to translate, we ask you, where is your Spanish translation? Uh, and building those systemic processes in so that they happen. Reaching out to patients, and we worked with with patient experience to um, let them know, instead of putting the burden on them to find out that we offer translation or that we have Spanish MyChart, reach out to them and let them know uh, that we have these services. And we've been fortunate to partner with so many different places in the organization, but particularly interpreter services have been so uh, helpful in helping us think about language access and how we approach it. And finally, the third technological um, intervention we did that I want to highlight is on data. Um, and it's really important to think that gaps in data um, exacerbate health disparities and create barriers to change. It's not just a black box. If you don't know what's happening, it's not that it's just there and you're going about your day. You're actually making the problem worse if you don't understand what it is. Like Dr. Tamron highlighted with um, offering uh, appointments, you actually, by improving or by uh, not seeing the negative effects that you're having, you actually could harm patients. And really it's a feedback cycle. If you lack access to easy, timely data, then you're not gonna have data standards. You're gonna have quality issues with that data. And that's gonna lead local leaders to really not be able to use their data. Um, and this was a gap that we had. We didn't know what our equity was and we didn't have timely data. So we worked with the health system to create an activation dashboard. Uh, I'm showing here the ambulatory dashboard, but there's also one for inpatient. And it's available timely. You can see data as of last month. So to know what's happening um, and what the activation rates are. Um, and it's one thing to have the data timely, but again, it's important to ensure data standards and make this data actionable. So we didn't make this on a population level. Not all patients seen in UCSF in the last three years is really hard. It, um, we've since interventions are focused on patients that are coming into clinic or patients that are in the hospital, we change the metric so it really is focused at the encounter base. So you can see the effect of changes that you're making in real time and know that worked, let's keep that up or we need to make changes. 
Um, and in terms of transparency and accountability, we work to make sure you can see this for your individual clinic. You can roll the data all the way up to UCSF, Oakland, BCH, and even for all UCSF data to really understand what's happening in the areas, highlight areas that are doing well, and make improvements in your own areas. I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Ling, who's going to talk about how operate some key operational initiatives that took this data and really ran them. Okay, thanks, Eris. Um, I'm sorry for those the folks that are there that I can't be there in person, but Dr. Oates will help me drive. Um, as he's already gone over, we are a technical team, but we recognize that MITRE activation requires significant operational lift and partnership. So I'm going to go over some of the operational engagements um, that we help participate in, including a BCH-sponsored Kaizen, uh, our BCH Cross Bay MyChart Workgroup, um, some of the systematic goals that have been implemented to incentivize MyChart activation for our patients, um, the GME Reflect program, and go over some clinic-specific examples of uh, working on MyChart activation disparity. Okay, um, so in October and November of 2022, a uh, multidisciplinary group of us participated in a week-long disparities in my chart activation Kaizen. And the Kaizen model is focusing on continuous improvement um, and efficiency. So we engaged in various activities. Um, I put up some pictures of some of the examples, but to the left, you can see uh, a waste wheel um, and idea generation down below. We then broke into sub teams to work on different areas that were identified that could be made more efficient and eliminate waste. One of the main outcomes of the week long Kaizen was streamlining activation workflows. So you can see in the picture here, the sticky notes on the left depict all the steps required to activate patients based on whether they were there in clinic um, or if they were um, doing telehealth. And we streamline this to a simple process that you can see on the right. Um, this was standardizing and making more equitable identity verification that Dr. Oates talked about that is necessary for parents to get uh, an EPIC record. Um, and originally, that included parents needing to go through a credit check, and you can see where that can um, put some inequity systematically to our patients. So the value add was a process that took days to six minutes. Um, additionally, we got rid of some of the forms that were required after discussing their necessity with privacy and legal. And a lot of this work from the Kaizen continues on in our BCH Cross Bay MyChart Activation Workgroup. Um, there has been significant um, BCH leadership sponsorship, uh, and we appreciate uh, working together in their partnership. MyChart Activation and working on disparities was a BCH Tier 3 goal. And in San Francisco, it was included as an IAP goal for the staff. You can see the IAP goal listed out here, but in FY23, the goal was to decrease MyChart activation disparities in all the groups you see below. So comparing to white patients in Black and African American patients, decreasing from 29 to 26%, in Latin A patients um, from 33 to 30%, and in LEP patients, 38 to 34%. Here are some of the tactics that the staff in San Francisco have taken to address my chart activation disparity, including retraining staff, auditing that they're following standard workflows, implementing the new standard work for proxy and teen activation, as I mentioned, improving identity verification and streamlining that, no longer requiring a form um, that needed to be printed and mailed back to the clinic, um, advertising, posting, and disseminating uh, information about the availability of Spanish MyChart, 
and then designating folks um, to engage and do outreach to Latin A patients, Black and African American patients, and LEP patients, as well as assigning activation ambassadors and champions in each clinic location. So um, many thanks to, to many people and probably too many that I can't fit on the slide. Um, these are the results from the IAP for FY23 um, at Mission Bay. So you can see, uh, Eris, if you click one more, you can see in uh, GMB6, which are the medical pediatric specialties, that all three groups decreased their disparities. Um, in GMB6, the pediatric surgical specialties for Black and African American patients, uh, they were able to meet their target. And then um, in Madison and at Pritzker, they were both able to decrease for Latin-A and LEP patients uh, and meet the their target of decreasing disparities in those populations. Um, I should also highlight a partnership with our trainees and through the REFLECT program that many of you are probably familiar with. Um, our fellows in pediatric rheumatology as well as pediatric GI and ophthalmology have taken MyChart activation disparities as one of their goals for the REFLECT program. And um, working with Dr. Rosenbluth, it's now going to be a standard offering to work on my chart activation disparities for FY25. Okay, <clears throat> I'm gonna go over a couple specific uh, clinic examples. I know there's a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of work that has happened throughout the organization on this problem. So I'm only going to highlight a couple, and it doesn't, uh, it's not meant to be inclusive, but just give you a flavor of some of the efforts that have been going on. So in Madison Clinic, it's a it's a busy slide. I know I'm not going to read all the bullet points, but um, I think our slides will be there for your reference. There were a couple key categories that were worked on, including staff awareness of my chart activation status, patient education, and using presumptive language rather than asking, would you like to sign up for my chart? Staff would share the benefits of signing up for my chart and tell families that their providers would like them to sign up that day, as well as ongoing collaboration between the front desk and clinical staff and really incorporating my chart activation into standard work. Um, Dr. Oates showed you the dashboard so Madison Clinic was able to track their efforts their efforts began in November of 2022 and are ongoing. Here is a snapshot from the dashboard of my chart activation by language. And you can see that the Spanish speaking patients are highlighted in the purple dotted line below. Um, when this started, the disparity in activation was about 30%. And as of January, 2024, this disparity is down to 15%. And that's despite the English speaking patients also increasing about 4% over time. Uh, we also worked on this in, in my own clinic in pediatric rheumatology. We have an, an LVN at Mission Bay and a nurse in Oakland that reviews the schedule one to two months in advance and also during their other daily work. Um, they identify the Spanish speaking patients that are inactive and uh, if they note them to be pending, they'll resend the code. If they're inactive, they check to see if there's a parent record. If there's none, they'll call the family, educate them on the benefits of my chart, and if they're interested, send them the code. We've also done training with our faculty around um, activation workflows and reviewed data ongoing with our faculty and fellows. Um, so here is our data. We also focused on Spanish speaking patients because that's where our disparity seemed to be uh, after consulting the dashboard. Here are uh, our efforts by campus. On the left, you can see our San Francisco clinic. And keep in mind, this is where the IAP was also in place. So a multidisciplinary approach. And you can see that the gap in activation for our patients who speak Spanish compared to those who prefer English really closed. 
uh, or is closing or getting close to closing. Um, and then in Oakland uh, and Walnut Creek, it's a little bit more modest of a closure, but still a trend that the uh, disparity is de decreasing with these focused efforts. Thank you. Um, so Nikki highlighted uh, several specific clinics and the improvements they made. We just wanted to return to the sort of overall data um, and show um, BCH wide how things have changed since our starting point, which was in June of 2021. Um, so this slide, which Mari showed at the beginning um, and showed the disparity between adults and pediatrics, disparity across the East and West Bay and disparity comparing primary care with specialty care. So this is data as of January, 2024. And you can see that there has been improvement. Um, as I joked around when we were preparing for these, like I like to go back and forth so that you can see the little bars go up, um, but the disparity still exists, um, but there has been improvement across all those dimensions. So uh, pediatrics compared to adults, East Bay compared to West Bay and primary care compared to specialty care. Um, Again, looking at uh, the uh, disparity by race and ethnicity, um, our prior data was the June 2021 at the very end of this chart. And you can see there was some improvement, but it continues to be a relatively flat line since sort of an um, initial improvement over the last year, but still improvement um, and still uh, somewhat of a close in the gap uh, between those top lines and those bottom lines. And then again, looking at the disparity by language, our initial data is all the way um, to the right of the screen of the June 2021. Um, and you can see improvement across the board with some moderate improvement in closing the gap, but with still a long way to go. So where do we go from here? Um, you know, I think that there are still barriers. There's barriers um, from patients, there's barriers from providers, and there's always sort of the barrier of competing priorities. And when we think about how to both um, strategically intervene, I think that's an important uh, consideration. When we, one area that we really struggled with was trying to get additional patient perspectives to try to figure out what are the barriers for them. Um, Eris mentioned we did uh, do some focus groups um, and we obviously have a very committed uh, patient um, voice here at UCSF, although often those are not the people who are not on my chart. So trying to get the patient voice of the people who aren't on my chart proves to be very challenging. From the data that we collected, we sort of bucketed the people who are not into my chart into sort of four different areas, the patients who don't know that my chart even exists. And that's a small, small uh, bucket at this point. Um, patients who want to sign up but can't. Um, and, you know, Eris talked about some of, and um, uh, Nikki as well talked about some of the efforts that we did to try to reduce those um, sort of inconveniences. Um, patients who don't see the value in my chart, um, and then patients who don't want to sign up. Obviously, the patients who don't want to sign up, um, we're always going to have some portion of that. But it's really those people in those sort of two middle areas, the patients who want to and can't, um, and the patients who don't see the value that we're really trying to reach at this point. And one thing that we found both in our sort of limited focus groups and that plays out in the literature is that Patients report having providers directly talk to them about ePortals, or in this case, my chart and its utility can make a significant impact on whether or not they activate and whether or not they use the ePortal. Um, and um, I think that's that's a really key factor. Eris talked about sort of equitable um, offering of my chart, right? Um, but that also includes the way that providers in particular talk about my chart and who they choose to talk about my chart with. Um, so we did want to take this opportunity just to review where you find if your patient is enrolled in my chart and what it looks like. Um, so there's that icon right next to their name in the storyboard that if they are inactive in any sort of way, it shows up as either gray if they're not active at all, um, blue with a sort of clock 
uh, as a um, indicator that it's been pending, which means they've gotten an activation code, but have not enrolled um, or declined, which is pretty rare. Um, and if they are active, it shows up with a little green check inside their computer icon. Um, when you hover over it, it actually will show you um, sort of when they last access it. And if they are a teenager, if they have their own account in addition to having a proxy account. Um, we did make a, um, and we are sort of in the process of rolling this out, an improvement which now sort of links the guarantor for that patient as a potential proxy for their, um, for their child. So if you actually click on that, if it's inactive and you click on that little button, you are given this little prompt, which offers like, do you want to text their guarantor a code? Because that we think this is their most likely proxy. Um, there's some additional uh, sort of upcoming enhancements that we have. Um, we're working with the um, both the technical team and the newborn nursery to try to automatically create uh, my chart accounts for newborns who are born in our hospital and link them with their uh, mothers because often their mothers have received prenatal care here and definitely were patients of ours because they are admitted in the hospital as well. Um, we often sort of get asked about not just activation, but actual utilization. And we know that there are some disparities within utilization. We also know that as we sort of continue to automate the activation, we may be actually creating additional utilization disparities because people may be enrolled, but they may not be using it. So we are working on a dashboard similar to the activation dashboard to track utilization disparities. Um, we're also working on um, improving access for resource or foster parents. Um, so that, cause that is another sort of dimension of inequity that occurs right now. And then finally, Eris um, described the workflow for Spanish translation, which is a bit cumbersome. And so we are working on um, improving that with some AI routing um, to allow messages immediately to go to an appropriate translator pool. We have lots of thank yous. Um, this group obviously was a team effort, but in reality, this was a huge team effort. Um, lots of thank yous to the executive leadership, as Eris mentioned, interpreter services, um, BCH quality, um, the health equity leadership, uh, patient experience, and then the Kaizen in specific. A lot of work was done with Apex clinical systems and privacy risk and legal. Of course, we had a lot of support from our health informatics team and research. Thank you, guys. We do have like five, 10 minutes for questions, et cetera. As people in the audience start thinking about these, there's one on um, uh, Zoom that I think I know the answer to as a Mike Chart user, but I'm going to make sure that you clar um, clarify this. Um, uh, to get into the system, does, um, do you need two factor validation? To, for to get into the my chart. To get into my chart, you do not need, right now you do not need two factor. Um, uh, you just need your username and password. Okay. In terms of um, translation, it seems like these computer translators now are so good. Just wondering, do you still need to go through the kind of delay of having a, uh, sending it to a yeah, it's a great question. Do you want to? Yeah. Want to repeat the question? Yeah, sure. Um, so, in terms of translation, um, what is uh, with such AI and language models? Should we use the tra that translation as opposed to a person? Um, they've come far, but you know, this is medical care and we want to make sure to do it right. And so working with our interpreter services policy, that's absolutely something we're thinking about. How do we leverage these technologies to make it faster and make it easier? But particularly with healthcare information, we want to make sure someone is able to see and validate that information. Um, it's We recognize that patients are taking the information and they're probably putting their notes into Google Translate. They're probably sending their messages um, and providers may be doing similar, but we wanna make sure to do that in the right thoughtful way. And we're working with the health system on that at a higher level to how do we leverage these tools um, and make it faster. I think we are looking at, for example, uh, AI or uh, computer models generating a draft and then having a person review it. The hard part with 
translation services, if I get that draft, for example, if I use Google Translator, I have no way of knowing is that translation correct or not because I don't speak the language that I'm using. So you still sort of at this point do need that double check of a person. But as Eris mentioned, it might be a way to make it faster um, uh, and potentially um, expedite things. Especially once we have our internal UCSF um, engines rather than the ones out there that are probably more prone to have hallucinations and other <laughs> fantasies. Um, I have a question for you. As a MyChart user myself, I totally love it. And I also have oftentimes wondered, um, especially the result messaging that comes in through MyChart, if you're not a medical person, um, there is actually nothing that comes with that that says you can contact X, Y, and Z if you don't understand this result or you need an application or whatever. So have you run into the limitations of my chart that isn't particularly true for people who are um, not, uh, for whom English is not a preferred language um, and, and or who have uh, uh, education levels that might prohibit them from understanding some of the things that we there. Yeah, I think it's a really good uh, question. So I'll answer two parts to it. Um, first, um, you are correct. The results, not only are they um, often in medicalese, right, but they are also often only in English. So we do have my chart Spanish available, um, where a lot of the sort of generic um, uh, web-based interface is in Spanish as opposed to English. But when they actually click on the results or click on a note, they are getting that in English. So already there's still some inequity there and we don't have it in any other languages besides Spanish, right? Um, in addition, yes, like the there's very little sort of interpretation of that. Um, interestingly, and I think Eris sort of highlighted that, um, that turns out not to be sort of as big of a barrier to, um, and even with the sort of um, uh, doctor speak in your notes, for example, people of uh, lower educational status, people in like historically disadvantaged groups tend to actually value those notes more um, than people in higher economic status and higher educational status. So it's not perfect. <laughs> Um, I will also say like, as a, both as a patient, and as a provider, there's sort of like a lot of uh, flyers, et cetera, saying like, when you get your results, if you have questions, contact us, et cetera, that poses its own set of problems. Um, so I won't, I won't go too far into that. Um, but, um, but it, you know, it's sort of a double-edged sword on their front. Um, there are two more questions here. Uh, one from Dr. Jim Cadbury. Uh, any safeguards for data on the emerging adults? I assume he means young adults, teenagers. Yes, yeah. Um, so we didn't go into the details of what, um, of the sort of different levels of proxy for 12 to 17 year olds versus um, under 12 or over 18. But the, sh the short answer is um, between the ages of 12 and 17, um, the MyChart access for both the proxy and the teenager is uh, restricted. So they don't have access to their medication list, for example, because there might be sensitive medications. Um, there are ways to block notes from being shared for this age group. There's ways to block visits for this age group. Um, the proxy access and the teen access, they can each have independent access to MyChart but that access is actually the same. What they are looking at is the same. And we as an institution made that decision because um, we found that many, uh, or there was evidence that many teens did not actually have reliable confidential access to their own account, meaning their parent was logging in as them. Um, so, so yes, there are safeguards uh, in place. Um, and then uh, someone from the general asks, um, how does requesting pediatric access look like? How does, sorry, I missed Pediatric the... proxy access, requesting pediatric... Requesting pediatric, pediatric proxy access. So, um, uh, so... <laughs> um, so, uh, there, so, as Nikki alluded to in the Kaizen, we tried to streamline that process quite a bit. Um, 
So now it used to be that if you came in person, you had to fill out a form to request access. You no longer have to do that. We can actually just give you access immediately. Um, now, as Eris alluded to, the parent needs to have an account um, and then needs to, needs to have well, she needs to have a medical record number and then have a MyChart account. So that guarantor process that we went to, uh, if the parent is the guarantor, which very often they are, that automatically creates their medical record for them. So then they just need to get a MyChart account. Um, and for an adult, as Eris alluded to, you just go to the MyChart website and create that account. Um, so we have streamlined that process quite a bit. Um, if they are not in clinic and they have their own account, you can actually just request it through their MyChart account as well. Nicole, were you going to add anything? Yeah, one other thing I was just going to add is the way we were able to get rid of those forms and the Experian identification was leveraging clinic workflows and their standard work for how they verify parents are who they are who they say they are when they bring their child to the clinic. And so um, we have the clinic staff verify in the same way that they do for that um, so that that credit check is not needed when you're requesting proxy access. All right. Well, for this great presentation, and uh, um, we'll look forward to seeing you again in a, maybe a year or two and see where we're at. at that. Thank you so much. Very nice.